when you take a look at the life of a church, you will see a lot of preaching, teaching, praise, worship, Sunday school, parties, Bible studies, activities, church camps, vacation Bible schools, fellowship dinners. You'll see all kinds of meetings. You'll see all people putting together different activities of various kinds. You will see seasonal programs and activities. You will see the Lord's Supper partaking in. You will see people serving and giving and working. And I believe that's all wonderful and good. And I think you'll see that in about every church you will ever attend. But I also believe that at times, in the life of a church, people can lose their focus on why we do it. Um, I think it's always interesting that when you're a part of something, whether it's leadership, and I've always loved leaders that do this, or planning people that do this, that sit down and say, okay, we're going to have this activity, or we're going to have this program but in what way does this activity fulfill the great commission of what we're a part of? And if it doesn't play a part in someone being led to come to know Jesus Christ, then why do it? If someone's not going to stand up and have a word of prayer, if someone's not going to stand up and read scripture, if someone's not going to reach out to the people that are involved, then why are we doing it? Because everybody can have activities and programs in a community. But not everybody is a part of the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ is about leading people. That's why we see in the bulletin, I've written a letter that I keep in there to welcome people to the church. And, and the focus of our church is, if someone is not a Christian, that they would be led to become a believer in their life. And if someone already is a believer that what we do can help them become more mature as a believer. It's a simple plan that's in the New Testament church when you read the book of Acts. And it's always supposed to be about that focus. And, it, and, and it's, it's very important because, uh, man, I, I, when I was a young youth minister, I, I was a part of a, uh, a group of men in Wichita that were pretty sharp leaders I really enjoyed them, and I'm indebted to them in my life. And uh, I didn't get to say a lot as a young youth minister, but I got to listen a lot. And one of the one of the elders came in to one of the meetings, and he said, "Hey, how'd you guys like that sermon today?" I said, "Well, it was it was entertaining." And one of them said, it, "And and uh, and it was it was funny, uh, and I enjoyed it." And finally, the one leader said, can any of you guys in this room tell me any scripture that the minister used in his sermon yesterday? We're not comedians. We're a church. And I was sitting there going, oh, this is not, this is not good. Yeah, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, this meeting is taking a turn. And I thought, well, he, he was being very sharp and perceptive in the fact that we get caught up in, you know, I'm not an entertainer. I'm not a comedian. I'm a minister of the gospel. I remember John Wesley reading in one of my church history books, sending out preachers across America to preach the gospel to churches. And when the young preachers would come in, he would ask them and interview them, did, any, did you get run out of town? Did anyone try to injure you for preaching the gospel? And two of the guys come in and said, no one ran us out of town, and no one said anything to us about our preaching. He said, you two are fired. Because if you're out there doing what the Lord wants you to do, somebody's going to come after you. I thought, well, that's perceptive. And when you look at the life of the church, it's important that we always keep our focus I mean, when you look at Matthew 28, one of the very last things that Jesus shared with all of his men, we have a purpose. We are to be a purpose-driven people about what we do in Christianity. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You may not like to hear it, 
but it's true we have a job to do for God but if you're always spinning your wheels in your own spiritual life and you can't get out of the mud in your own spiritual life you're not doing anybody any good and especially God because you're only focused on you being stuck and getting out of the rut when God's got a whole job for you to do when you get unstuck but a lot of Christians are so busy being stuck where they are all the time they don't get anything done for God Now I know I knew you wouldn't like that but what does Jesus say in the Great Commission when you look in Matthew chapter 28 he says I want you to go that's a command in the Greek language and not that if you get an opportunity I mean I want you to go uh, uh, you know Oswald Chambers in his famous devotional book and I can never remember the title my wife's favorite book outside the Bible but he says in one of his devotionals if God calls you go not tomorrow not next month not next year go and if you don't go when he calls you to go that's a sin he didn't give you the opportunity that you get to make up all the rules he's the one that called you and the one that sent you just like we were talking about high school football a while ago didn't you see players at a high school football team walk over to the sideline not unless they have a concussion and say to the coach you know coach I, I know you've been working all week on a game plan and you got a you got your clipboard there hanging on your waist and all that. but you know I tell you Red, I, I, I think I got a better play you know before I could get that out my coaches would say I tell you what I got a plan for you Mike why don't I turn the clock on and you run around this stadium until I say quit don't ever come up to me again saying you got a better plan than all the coaching team and sometimes we're like that with God he's given us something he wants us to go do a command in the Greek and we're walking up saying well now God I, I don't I don't I don't know if they're gonna be very accepting of this he didn't ask that he said I want you to go and I want you to make disciples and I want to tell you something it's not easy to make disciples you, you, you can't have one hand on the doorknob and another hand on your Bible making disciples. I know that American people, I love America. I'm going to tell you something, I love America. Can I say that enough? I love America. I love living here. I think it's the greatest place in the history of the world. I mean that. Okay? But we are a busy people. My goodness. We are so busy. Wow, it's amazing. It's amazing how we don't even know our own families. We don't even have time to visit our own family. We don't have time to even spend with our own families. It's shameful that we only see our families at weddings and funerals. It's shameful that if you're an employer of people, that you don't let your employees go to funerals of their friends, but only family members, and say goodbye to someone. We're so busy trying to meet a bottom line in this country that it does turn us sometimes into something that we shouldn't be. Because I'm going to tell you something. To make a disciple, you've got you to spend some time with them. To get to know someone, I mean, there's a lot of us. We go to church here every week, a lot of us, and we see each other week. But do we really know that much about each other? I mean, it's amazing. I was taught, you talk to someone and say, you know, wow, we might even be related. <laughs> or I've gone to church with you this many years. I didn't know that about you. Well, we don't ever talk. We're always so busy going for our, because we're just in such a hurry, aren't we? And to make a disciple, to someone that you don't, you know what you got to do? You got to invite them over to your house to eat. And, and you got to go spend some time drinking coffee with them. And, and you got to slow your, oh man, slow down? Yeah. You got to slow your life down and go do something with somebody and get to know them. It, it takes time to make a disciple. But people will never care how much you know until they know how much you care.
and you're going to have to spend some time with them to get to know them. You go fishing with somebody, you go hunting with somebody. I'm telling you what, if a group of guys go to a hunting camp together, you'll know some things when you get home. Somebody out snores somebody else. Or somebody else eats weird food when they go hunting, you know. I mean, you, but unless you do it, you're not going to know that stuff. And so I'm telling you that in this world that we're in, he said, I want you to go, and I'm commanding you to go and spend some time with people, getting to know them. Jesus was the Son of God, and you know where? He went down to the marketplace, and he spent time with people. He drank coffee with ordinary people. He didn't act like a king. And those people, they loved him. They fell in love with him because he spent time with them. And he got to know who they were. And he was, he was caring about it. I spoke about this one time, and one of my professors walked up to me, and I'll never forget this after I was done, and he, he walked up and he said, Mike, I enjoyed your message. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And I thought, that's right. We're supposed to be about the business of going out and finding people that need to be discipled and need to be baptized. Because that's what it says. To disciple them, to baptize them, and he says to teach them. You know, I love one of the things we do at our church um, that we gather together and we have a baptismal service and we talk about it and I like to sit here and talk to people because a lot of times on Sunday morning we're in such a hurry and the, and the huge mistake, listen to me, in American churches, I, I preach this in any church I've been in, we're in such a hurry to go live our lives because, man, I know the chiefs, they got a scrimmage today at 1 o'clock and we're in a hurry and we got stuff we want to do and then there's this and that that we want to go to this and that. But we can't leave people who just gave their life to Christ standing in our churches with wet clothing on and just leave them standing here and go home. When does someone walk up and say, hey, you need to get involved in my Sunday school class? Hey, you need to come and go eat. Where you eat lunch at today? You need to come out with our family and go eat lunch with us today. You, you need. Hey, I tell you, what are you doing this week? Come with us. You know, we need to get involved in their lives that day. We leave people standing here, and then somewhere down the road, we say, "What happened to that person? Where'd they go? What became of their life?" We don't know because we got so busy and we left them standing here and we don't know a thing about their life anymore. It wasn't enough. It says to go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. We need to follow up with people when they become a Christian. We need to lead them into the teaching. Hey, listen, they're just a baby. We have people who have babies in the church all the time. You don't go home and leave them at the hospital. Man, you take them home and you coddle them and you care for them and you know that they can't take care of themselves. Well, what do you think a brand new Christian is? They, they know just about enough as a white belt in a karate class to get whipped. They, they don't know anything that they need to know. Someone needs to teach them about what Christianity is and about what they have become a part of. They're just a brand new baby believer. And he says, these are Jesus' commands. Listen, I want you guys to go and do this and to follow up. And, and that means us because we are that church today to do that very thing. We are to keep the main thing the main thing, when you look at Luke chapter 15, I believe it's verse 10, when you're looking and it says, when one person gives their life to Jesus Christ, all the angels in heaven rejoice. That's how precious it is. That's how important it is for someone to change their life. 
I don't think you should take that lightly. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, in the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, it says there, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The very purpose that Jesus came is for people to get to know about Christianity, to change their life, to become a part of a saved relationship. That's the main thing of Christianity. All those activities that we do in a church, if it does not lead someone to make a decision for Jesus Christ, we need to scrap it and do something else and replace it with something better. Because anybody can do an activity. Everybody does activities. But we're supposed to be involved in things that lead people to know about Jesus Christ. That's what's important. That's what's so imperative. We can't lose sight of the goal. We can't lose our focus on what everything, why we do it. It's so, so important. Well, that's my introduction for today. You talked about in your meditation about God does things and we wonder why. You know, in our society, we would say, well, he just touched it a little bit. Well, he just made a little... No, God, he doesn't function that way. He, he's the one that says, I want it done this way. It's my way or the highway. And that's how it is with God. He's in charge and I'm not. And it's my duty to listen to him. And we can say, why would God choose Peter to preach the sermon that started what you're a part of today? Why would he? Only God would do that. You and I probably wouldn't have. I love that part about Acts chapter 2. Of all the people on the planet, why does he pick Peter to preach this sermon? Do you realize that you wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for this message? It's one of the second greatest sermons. I call it outside of Jesus' first sermon, this is the second greatest sermon in all the New Testament. It's the day the church began and God chose Peter, a failure, a man who made a horrible mistake to preach this sermon. And it's powerful because he covers the whole Bible and everything that he talks about. I want you to follow along with me. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire of billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood and before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't say everybody will be saved. Everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There is a contingency on that. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves all know. They had seen everything that Jesus did. They knew who he was. And they had seen all that glory and splendor. This man was handed over to you before God's by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, I want you to get this. 
because as he goes on in this message, what he's saying is, you knew who he was. You saw what he did. But when you had to choose between Barabbas and Jesus, you chose Barabbas. Now, what he's saying is, you may have done that, but God had a plan that was going to be in motion that you were going to be a part of that and do that. Almost as if you couldn't help yourselves. But what he's saying is, but you made that choice. You saw Jesus, and you knew who he was. And yes, I know all the Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests were going through the crowd and being antagonistic, and they were causing an uproar, and you chose Barabbas, and you knew the criminal scoundrel that he was. He was the scum of the earth, and you chose him instead of this man, Jesus. That's what it, that, in a nutshell, just stay with me, that's what he's telling them, and he's saying, and you're the ones that did it. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life you will fill me with the joy in your presence. Then he says again, Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. He was just a man and he's dead and he's gone and that's what he's making sure. He was not Jesus. Good man did wonderful things for God. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what is to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received him from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out in what you now see and hear, for David not ascend to heaven, yet said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Then he says again, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus that you crucified, both the Lord and Messiah. So if you wanted to put that in modern terms, your sin and my sin put Jesus on that cross just like them if Peter was here today preaching he would say your sin and my sin put Jesus on that cross that's what he was saying in the message and if you brought it even up here to our turn and they're starting to pay attention now. Well, you, you know when you're about to get in trouble and you've made a horrible mistake. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus that you crucified, both the Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, now I want you to understand, in all of Christianity... America flies this flag. We're very proud of it. Okay? We'd give our lives for it. Christianity flies this flag. Representing all of Christianity. And the foundational scripture of Christianity is right here. In all of Christianity, Acts chapter 2, this is it. This is the foundational passage of Scripture for all of Christianity that flies that flag. When they realized that what they had done was true 
to what Peter was saying, it says their hearts were torn. When you hear news that you don't like to hear, it breaks your heart. It drops us to our knees. And what Peter did through the power of God preaching that message, he got them to understand that what they had done was a horrible mistake. Now they weren't smart enough yet to realize it was part of God's plan. Okay? Just like you and I. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, Evan or anybody else in here, I never realized that God's plan for my life was this. Now I'm very proud of that today. But you would have never got me to understand that. If you'd have walked to me as a teenage boy and said, you're going to be a minister in Fredonia, Kansas one of these days, I would say, get out of here. Because it was nowhere on my radar for what God had in plans for my life. And God has plans for every person in this room. And it's tough for us when we don't see them yet of what God has for us in our lives. And, and for them, they didn't get it yet. It was starting to soak in because they were torn and they were cut to the heart. And they say to Peter what? And rough paraphrase, if this is what we did, what should we do then? Is what they say to him. Isn't it? And what does he tell them? Do what I did. It doesn't say that in your text. He says one word, repent. In the Greek language, that means to change your mind and purpose in life. If you were moving in this direction, you would completely about face and you would move in this direction. That's what it means in a nutshell, to change your life and move in a different direction. Peter says, do what I did. He said, because about a month ago, you know what I did. And I repented. And God allowed me to preach this message. And that's what he tells them. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promises for you and your children and for all whom are far off and for all whom the Lord our God will call remember it says that for all those who call upon the name of the Lord not everybody calls upon the name of the Lord and wants to be saved but some do fortunately most of you have and you are reaping the benefits of seeing that Christianity is a wonderful thing. This is a powerful thing. This is the day that the church began. Now listen to me here very closely. I don't want to cause any ruckuses. I don't want to cause any trouble. I just, my job as a Christian representing God is to be truthful and honest. Okay? So I'm going to be as honest with you as I possibly can. I am not a Christian church Christian. I'm a New Testament Christian. My job as a Christian man is to preach the Word of God and the truth of the book of Acts. And if this church wants to do that, I am proud to be a part of it. And if any church wants to do that, I'd be a proud to be a part of it. Okay? That's our job as a minister of the gospel to preach the truth. Now, there are a lot of people that don't understand, and listen to me closely because I know some of you are from this background in your life. Every church in America had the very beginning place right here. Acts chapter 2 is where any church in the world ever started now I'm going to share with you and this is a hard pill to swallow and stay with me 
and God's design for the church, there is one. That's it. So here's the million dollar question. Kevin Lewis isn't here today, he's always here. And when he became a Christian, we were out fishing one day. And he was smart enough to pick up on all this as a new Bible student. He said, so Mike, we're talking. <laughs> so if all you're teaching in Bible study, and I was talking about what I am right now, is true, then how come there's 400 and some odd kinds of churches in America today? I said, that's the million dollar question, Kevin. I said, because according to the book of Acts, there's just one. And I said, honestly, from what I have researched and read in my own studies, hard for you to all believe, people can't get along with each other. So I'll just go down the road and start my own. It never had anything to do with God's design. It was about people not being joined together in unity. Because according to the book of Acts, there's just one church. Now, let me throw you something out here before you go eat lunch. If that's true, are there some churches that God is not going to recognize on the day of judgment? <laughs> well, you might want to put that in your back pocket. I think I'd want to go to one that he is. I think I'd want to find one that teaches truth and stands by truth no matter how I do it. Because I'm going to tell you something. The hardest thing I do as a minister is tell people the truth. It's easy to compromise just to get along to want to be somebody's buddy. But to stand up and be a person of truth? Hmm. Because when you read the book of Proverbs, when you've got a good friend, you got a good friend, your good friend will get in your face. And he'll say to you, straighten up. You're not acting like you ought to be acting, and you're my friend, and I'm telling you friend to friend. See, that's a good friend. They'll come get on you. Your friends will hold you to be accountable for what you ought to be. Can we go out there and do some weird stuff? Well, there's a lot of weird stuff out there. Oh, man. I was watching on the news the other day, and, and there was this woke church. Wow. On the day of judgment, God's probably going to say, you know, you all just wait about ten minutes. I'll be with you in a second. I got just a little hotter place. I was driving down the road one day, and the Episcopalian church was talking about religious news and it said they were going to ordain homosexual priests in the Episcopalian church and we will ordain you to be priests in the Episcopalian church as long as you don't practice what you believe. <laughs> I about wrecked my truck. I had to pull over on the side of the road and think yeah. <laughs> uh, are, are we, have we gotten there? Are we, that, that's making, <laughs> let's just make a committee out of our junior church kids. I, I mean, that was just crazy, isn't it? Do you think God was a part of that decision? No. So what I'm saying is, you better be careful that when you study the Bible, that you follow the plan that God has because if you touch the ark, you die. Are you saying, well, God, he might say you didn't follow the plan, you die. I had a plan for the church. Your church didn't follow it. Would God do that? We'll go back and read Sean's story. And it wasn't just a story, it's scripture. And listen to what he says when he goes on. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. You know what it means when you plead with people? 
<laughs> you get desperate. You all straighten your lives up. Stop it. Quit. I mean, I plead with you. Stop it. I, I, I've watched some of you parents when you got kids in the back and you're driving down the road trying to reach over. Stop it. Don't do it anymore. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. That fits right now. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number. When you study the Bible, I know this sounds confusing, but it's not that difficult. The Bible speaks in male gender. A lot of theological teachers believe when you break down the Greek language that he's talking about 3,000 families. Now I did a revival at a church in Missouri one time up in the hills, a little country church, and they're famous because on one Sunday they baptized 150 people on one day. Man, you know, if you're the minister, you're going to come out and say, time out, I need to take a break, go eat lunch, we'll be back. Right after lunch, we'll start the baptizing again. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's awesome. That's crazy. But 3,000 or 3,000 families? That's a lot of people the day the church began. That's awesome. As the praise team comes forward, though, Let's remember the goal as we wind this down. This church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders, signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. Well, there's, there's a mouthful right there. You, you know how long it would take me to get you guys wound up on a subject? There's some of you that I could get you started talking to that door, and we could come back in an hour, and you'd still be here arguing with it. They had everything in common. Sometimes I tell my wife, the Wadsworth part of my family, my mother was a Wadsworth. I will tell my wife sometimes, I love that part of my family because we just always get along. There's hardly any ever conflict I could ever remember from a child to this day. And it's so pleasurable to go and do things with people that are so fun to be around that seem to have so much in common that they just love you for who you are and you always belong here. I know you think, wow, I'd like to be a part of that family. But it's a, it's a blessing in the world we live in today. I, I mean, it truly is. You, you just feel a, a wholesomeness. You feel... A void is filled, you, you feel compassion, you feel accepted. You don't have to be something to be a part of it. You're, you're a part of it because of who you are. That's the way Christianity ought to be. In the body of Christ, everybody ought to have a common bond with each other. And you know the common bond that we have is Jesus. Yeah. They sold property and possessions and gave to anybody that had a need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, recently... You've seen young people, you've seen teenagers, 
you've seen people give their lives to Jesus Christ here at the church and you've read about it in the bulletin or heard announcements where through our young people programs for other programs have given their life to Jesus Christ. We do a lot of things in the life of a church, but the most important thing that we're ever a part of is when someone gives their life to Jesus Christ. They're in a greater moment. There isn't. I've asked fathers here in this group and in other places, when you get an opportunity to baptize your son or daughter or a friend, you can say to yourself in your heart, and I don't have to ask the men or women that have done this because I know how they feel. You can say to yourself in that moment as you're baptizing that person and knowing what it's all about that there isn't a greater place than I need to be than right here in this moment, right now, today. There isn't anything greater that I could be a part of than this. I challenge you to find something. When you're holding that person in your arms and their life is beginning with Jesus Christ, can you really say, I need to be somewhere else than here? No. You know in that moment, for the first time in your life, you're involved in something that you know without a shadow of a doubt is the greatest thing that you could ever be a part of. That's why the main thing is to keep the main thing in Christianity. Everything that we do is to help someone have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can't ever forget that. Or we have forgotten our identity and we've forgotten what we're all about. When someone gives their life to Christianity, talk to them, embrace them, pray with them, follow them up, encourage them, Help them to understand what you've been through in your life because that's what it's all about. Maybe this morning you need to be cut to the heart. You need to let Jesus have your life as we stand and sing this morning. Mm -hmm.